So we get straight into our, our third session, which is on herbicide resistance. Earlier we had Vijay talking to us about the survey results, but now Vijay is going to give us an overview of the distribution and resistance update uh, across Ireland. So Vijay, please. Thank you. Thanks, Ewan. So, uh, in this present presentation, I, I have compiled Glasshouse resistance work conducted from the start of the ECD project to date on the four problem grass weeds. As you know, sterile broom and wild oats are more widespread, and with black grass and Italian dry grass, we are seeing an increase in incidence as well as resistance cases. Before we look into the resistance results, let us look at the post-emergence herbicide option. The ACKs and ALS herbicides are the most extensively used modes of action for grass weed control within crops. The ACKs herbicide has three chemistries, the DEN, FOP, and DIM. The DEN, or axial, can only be used in wheat and barley and provide wild oat and Italian ryegrass control, while the FOP and DIM graminicide can only be used in non-cereal break crop situation and they provide a broad spectrum grass weed control. While Centurion Max is uh, unique, which has limited the uh, crop and weed specificity, it can only be used in oil seed rape and beet crop situation, and on the label, it provides control on black grass and animal meadow, meadow grass. From the ALS, with the, out of five herbicide, uh, ALS herbicide chemistries, the sulfonyl urea or Yasus or Pacifica and the triazolopyrimidine or the Broadway star can only be used in winter wheat and they provide a broad spectrum grass wheat control. Let's now look into the resistance work on black grass. So we have located, we have identified and located 34 black grass populations. This include survey sample and also suspect sample that was collected or submitted by the growers and industry each year from 2019. Out of 34 population, 19 population were found to be resistant to at least one ACKs or ALS herbicides. As you know, we have our own native uh, isolated blackgrass population since 1980s and also the suspect uh, resistant population introduced from the UK and Northern Ireland through seeds and subsequently spread through combines and balers uh, from moving from farm to farm. As you can see from the map, we now have confirmed resistant blackgrass population in all major tillage counties, and the main mechanism of resistance is target site resistance, or TSR. So let us look into the resistance severity and resistance spectrum. I have used uh, samples uh, collected as a part of the nationwide survey, the harvest sample 2020 and 21. Again, as mentioned in the morning, I use uh, uh, co county as my sample ID. The samples were collected from Cork, Meath, and Waterford. They were grown alongside a sensitive population. On your right, you have the untreated uh, control plants, which were not exposed to Pacifica. Moving from right to left, the dose rate increases from 0.25 to eight times the recommended field rate of Pacifica. As you can see, the sensitive population was well controlled by half field rate of Pacifica, and if you look at the cock population, it was well controlled when Pacifica was applied at the full rate. But if you take population from Meath and Waterford, the, uh, the recommended field rate was virtually ineffective, and even eight times the recommended field rate, there were few surviving plants from Meath and Waterford uh, population. Remember, these plants were sprayed at two to three leaf stage when they, when they were small and actively growing, and they were grown in a perfect glasshouse condition. The same population was then tested with ACK's graminicide, Stratus Ultra. Again, on your right, you have the untreated plants, which was not exposed to uh, Stratus Ultra. Moving from right to left, the dose rate increases from 0.25 to eight times the recommended field rate of Stratus Ultra. As you can see, the sensitive population was well controlled uh, by Stratus Ultra, applied at a full label rate, 
But if you look at uh, population from Cork, Meath, and Waterford, they all add surviving plants even at eight times the recommended field rate of Stratus Ultra. So the same population was again tested with another ACKS graminicide, Falcon. On your right, you have the untreated plants. Moving from right to left, the Falcon dose rate increases from 0.25 to eight times the recommended field rate. The sensitive population at the bottom was well controlled by uh, Falcon when applied at a full rebel rate. But if you look at uh, Cork, Meath, and Waterford population, even at eight times the recommended field rate, there were surviving plants. So the next question is, will glyphosate offer effective control? If so, what would be the recommended field rate would be needed to use on stubbles or to control relatively newly chit blackgrass seeds? So the same population uh, was tested with the different dose rates of glyphosate. On your right, you have the untreated plants. And moving from right to left, the glyphosate dose rate increases from 0.25 to 8 times the recommended field rate of 1.5 liter per hectare of glyphosate. Uh, that is 360 gram product. As you can see, uh, even at 540 grams per hectare, both resistant population from Cork, Meath, and Waterford, and even in sensitive population, there were few survivors. But at three liters per hectare of 360 gram product, or 1080 grams, we found uh, uh, total control. So th this suggests that if you have a black grass, whether it is sensitive or resistant, an higher rate above 720 is advised for an effective uh, control. So in 2022, again, uh, we found more farms with black grass, and these populations were collected, in, collected from different counties, and they were again tested with the, uh, all the black grass active herbicide with the likes of Falcon, Stratus from the ACKs, and Centurion Max, uh, this time uh, from the ACKs group, and Pacifica from the ALS group, and they were grown alongside the sensitive population. As you can see, the sensitive population was totally controlled, while uh, the cock population was resistant to, Falcon, uh, resistant to Falcon, Stratus, and Centurion Max, from uh, the ACKS group, but totally sensitive to Pacifica. But the Waterford, Meath, Tipperary, and Dublin uh, populations all were showing multiple resistance. So in summary, we have populations that are resistant to Falcon and Stratus. There are some population which, uh, that, uh, that Centurion Max is, is able to control. And we have a population that is resistant to Pacifica. So if the farms having ACK's resistant only population, there is an option of using the likes of uh, ALS Pacifica and the farms that have ALS resistant uh, uh, population only, then there is an option of using ACK's graminicide with the likes of Falcon, Stratus, or Centurion Max. And if you have population that is uh, resistant to multiple modes of action, like the ACK's and ALS, there is no uh, in-crop herbicide option to control these, prop, uh, these population effectively in spring. So let's move into the Italian ryegrass. Again, we have identified and located uh, 20 population of Italian ryegrass. This includes the samples collected from this uh, nationwide survey conducted in 2020 and 21, and also the suspect samples submitted by growers each year. Out of 20 population, 12 Italian ryegrass population was found to be resistant to at least one ACKs or ALS herbicides. We don't know because we don't know whether, uh, whether uh, the resistance is happening in a, in, a, in a wild type or the resistance is developing in a cultivated variety. And we also don't know whether uh, we have some introduced population from uh, similar to black grass from the UK and Northern Ireland. As you can see, we now have confirmed Italian ryegrass resistance in all major tillage counties. And the main mechanism of resistance is target site resistance, or TSR. So again, same like ryegrass, we, we uh, conducted uh, glasshouse studies to look at the resistance severity and spectrum. So we have samples here. Uh, again, I'm using county ID, uh, county as my sample ID, and nothing more than that. Um, uh, the samples were collected from Tipperary, Cork, Meath, and they were grown alongside sensitive population. And on your right, you have the untreated plants, and moving from right to left, uh, the dose rate increases from 0.25 to 8 times the recommended field rate of Pacifica. As you can see, the sensitive population was totally controlled, 
uh, when Pacifica was applied at uh, field rate, but all other population from Tipperary, Cork, Meath, the recommended rate was uh, virtually ineffective, and even eight times the recommended field rate, we had some sub survivors. The same population uh, was, uh, was, uh, was tested with the axial. Uh, you have the untreated plants on your right, and uh, moving uh, from right to left, the dose rate increases from 0.25 to eight times the recommended field rate of axial. As you can see, Tipperary and uh, the population from uh, Meath, Meath 2, were as sensitive as sensitive population. But if you, uh, if you take the population from Cork and Meath, um, they were, the, the field rate was virtually ineffective, and, and a higher rate of uh, four times the recommended field rate was required to have more than 70% control. So the same population was then tested with an AC case graminicide status ultra. On your right, you have the untreated plants, and moving from right to left, the dose rate increases from 0.25 to two, two, two times the recommended field rate. By the time you reach the recommended field rate, you can see all four resistant population were as sensitive as sensitive population, indicating that uh, there may be a control option in, uh, in, uh, in a non-serial break, break crop situation with the likes of uh, uh, graminicide falcon or status ultra. So again, in 2022, um, uh, we, uh, we received uh, or collected uh, suspect samples. The samples came from Tipperary, Meath, Dublin, and Cork, and they were grown alongside sensitive population. And we tested uh, all the Italian ryegrass active herbicide with the likes of Axial, Falcon, Stratus Ultra, and Centurion Max, and also the ALS herbicides with the likes of Pacifica and Broadway Star. As you can see, the sensitive population was totally controlled uh, by all the herbicides, but most of the population, Italian ryegrass population, were showing multiple resistance. So we had a question, will glyphosate be effective? If, if so, what rate would be needed? So we took the same population and tested with the different dose rate of glyphosate from 270, 540, and 810. As you can see, 270 uh, was virtually ineffective. 540, we found a few survi surviving plants, but 810 seems to be a, an effective option. option. So if you have a critical grass weeds, uh, like with the likes of black grass and Italian dry grass, uh, the advice of using glyphosate rates is of from 720 close to 1,000 grams per hectare. So again, uh, in summary, we have population that, is, uh, that, are, that are resistant to axial, falcon, status, and centurion. In some cases, status and centurion uh, can, uh, can still be, uh, still be effectively controlling the axial and falcon resistant population. And we know we have a population resistant to Pacifica and Broadway. So if you have population that is resistant to uh, AC case only herbicide, then there is an option of using Pacifica or Broadway Star. And farms having um, ALS resistant only population, then there is an option of using uh, the likes of axial, falcon, and other graminicide. But if you have uh, multiple resistance, there is no effective uh, uh, spring herbicide option for control. So let's move into the uh, spring wild oats. Um, so far, we have tested uh, 134 population. Again, this includes uh, uh, the samples collected uh, in, in our survey conducted in 2020 and 21, and the suspect samples that were sent by the industry each year. And out of 134 population tested, 33 population were found to be resistant only to ACK herbicide. Uh, the main reason being using the same herbicide repeatedly in the same field. And we know that we have resistance in all major tillage counties, and like black grass and Italian dry grass, target site resistance has been the main uh, resistance mechanism. So uh, 2022, we received a suspect uh, uh, wild oat samples. The samples came from uh, Wexford, Kildare, and Cork, and uh, we tested with the Axial and Falcon from the ACKs group, and Pacifica from the ALS group, all herbicides were applied at uh, label, uh, label field rate. As you can see, uh, most of the population were resistant to falcon or resistant to axial and falcon, but still Pacifica uh, was, uh, was found to be quite effective. So we received uh, 20 suspect population in uh, 2022, and out of 20 population tested, 70% of the population were resistant to falcon 
or uh, under, uh, and or axial. So we know from the sample that uh, we tested in, uh, uh, from the, we know from the sample that we used uh, in, uh, in a nationwide survey that uh, the Broadway, the ALS, uh, the likes of Broadway and Pacifica, irrespective of rate, they provide effective control. And we also know in some situation, Stratus Ultra is also, was also effective. So in summary, so far we have seen population that are resistant only to Falcon. We know we have population resistant to Falcon and Axial, or population that are cross-resistant to all the ACK herbicides with the likes of Falcon, Axial, and Stratus, but no resistance uh, in spring wild oats has been documented to Pacifica or Broadway Star uh, uh, on all 134 population that we tested. But you have to remember, remember that the Pacifica and Broadway Star uh, uh, relying, uh, relying solely on these herbicides can put pressure on uh, other species and may, may result in unintentional uh, resistance development, like if you take the story of uh, annual meadowgrass, for example. So finally, we have the bromes. Uh, as you know, sterile brome is the most widespread, but other brome types are also increasing. We have tested uh, more than 100 population. We haven't documented any full resistant brome population but more than 38% of population showed reduced sensitivity to the likes of uh, Pacifica and Stratus Ultra when applied at half-label rate. We suspect uh, the, the underlying mechanism as NTSR uh, or uh, enhanced uh, uh, metabolism. So this is the, uh, the figure is from uh, the, the survey that we conducted in 2020 and 21. On the x-axis, you have all the brome types. On the y-axis, you have the percent plant survival. And as you can see, when Stratus Ultra and Pacifica were applied at half la label rate, there were uh, 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 surviving plants. When, uh, when Stratus Ultra was applied at full label rate, they, provide, uh, they, they offered effective control. While the, uh, when uh, Pacifica was applied at full label rate, there were few surviving plants, but the survival rate was less than 30%. Uh, uh, but most of the population was effectively controlled by using a Pacifica at full label rate. So again, in 2022, we received a um, uh, suspect uh, brome population from uh, Kildare, Tipperary, and Wexford. Uh, we, uh, we treated them with all the brome uh, active herbicide, with the likes of Falcon and Stratus from the ACKs group, and Pacifica and Broadway from the ALS group, all applied at uh, recommended field rate. And uh, you can see that they, they, uh, they were quite effective in controlling uh, the brome population. So, so uh, as I mentioned previously, we don't have any full resistant brome population, but there are reduced sensitive uh, population uh, to, uh, to the likes of Pacifica and Stratus Ultra, especially due to use of uh, rates lower than the recommended. So the, so the key take home message is uh, at any cost, zero tolerance uh, approach is essential to keep uh, grass weeds away from your farm. And uh, if you rely solely on herbicide without an IPM approach, you will inevitably result in uh, resistant grass feeds. And as I said, in the, as I mentioned in the morning, resistant testing is critical. If, you have, if the farm's having black grass and Italian dry grass, all should be considered, considered as resistant suspect. And the final uh, key message is, uh, is use, uh, only use post-emergent uh, spring herbicide with the likes of uh, Axial, Falcon, or the ALS herbicide with the likes of Pacifica and Broadway Star as a tidy up option or as a follow up option rather than relying solely on those herbicides for a broad spectrum weed control. Just a message here, we, uh, if you have samples in stock, we, uh, you, can do, you can send the sa samples to us. We will be able to test for you and get back to you uh, with the results. And you know that we do it at a, 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 at a free of cost. That's it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Vijay. So um, we're going to go straight into our second speaker. Delighted to have Sarah Cook from from ADAS here, and uh, just to give us a perspective in terms of control of, of black grass from from the UK side. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Well, I came here to speak to you before the ECT project started and it was called learning from the mistakes of the English. Well, I've got good news and I've got bad news. You've done really well. The project's fabulous. You've all learnt loads about it. But the bad news is the English, they've made more mistakes. So as John mentioned, 
we've got resistance to fluvenicet. We're, we're building up resistance to the pre-emergences. So you've, you've still catch up with us, catch up with us. <laughs> Maybe we can learn from you. So what would you say is uh, uh, how much black grass is too much? You know, you find that in the UK, people live with it. You know, it's sort of like a thing that you, you live with. Um, but really, your level should be zero. You shouldn't let it get out of hand. And why is that? Yield losses can be really high. So 100 heads per meter squared, you can get about a 13% yield loss. And it can vary. It can vary over in fields and, and with varieties. Um, 500 heads, you can get virtually lose half of your crop. But you won't know that because you've got no control. You've got no untreated control next to it. So seed production. I like to go into a field, you put your feet at right angles and you look and count black grass plants between your feet. And that's about a tenth of a metre squared. So you can multiply that by 10 and get a figure per metre squared. So one plant per metre squared is 10 heads per metre squared. And each of those heads has about 100 seeds on it. If the black grass has got plenty of room to grow in an uncompetitive crop, you can get five or 10 times as much as that on, on he number of heads. You get a, th a thousand seeds per metre squared, 60% viability gives you six million seeds per hectare or two and a half million pounds per acre. You know, that's a lot of seeds. So your population can go from a very small population to a very massive population within one, two, three years quite easily if you don't do anything about it. And what does that look like? So 500 seeds, uh, heads per meter squared for harvest is about 1.2 pints or just under half a litre of black grass. But that's four tonne bags going back into your fields per hectare. That's what the equivalent is, and that's more than you would ever sow of winter wheat. So we're looking at IWM, or Integrated Weed Management, Integrated Pest Management. It's, it's a big thing in the EU at the minute, and it's basically trying to control weeds without pesticides, but using pesticides or herbicides as your last resort. So they are there at the end, waiting, and you're bringing to them a very low population of the weed. So understanding the, your enemy, exploiting its weaknesses. So understanding the weed biology, and we've talked about this, we, we know about weeds, and, and black grass is one we know a lot about. We know a lot about the biology of black grass. And then stubble management, so we've talked about this, whether you should roll, cultivate, or leave stubble after harvest. And then we talk about stale seed beds, making a seed bed so that the, the weeds germinate and we can spray them off with glyphosate. So do we bury the seed or do we let the seed emerge? And then there's our crop. The crop's really important. We talked about rotation and rotation is important. Rotation allows us to use different herbicides in different crops. We can use different cultivations, different drilling dates. Um, we can minimise weed emergence and we can make a competitive crop. And I'd say to you that what's one of the most important things is a competitive crop. So getting the crop in in good conditions and getting a competitive crop is incredibly important. Bare patches, weeds make the most of bare patches, block cultures, whatever you, you want. You give them the space and they'll take a mile. And then the pre-harvest option. So what can you do pre-harvest? you can just burn it all out with glyphosate, which is quite typical if you've been to cereals in the UK. You'll see the fields that are half gone because we just burnt out the black grass. My question to you is, why are you leaving it so late? You can see the black grass in the autumn. Why don't you get rid of it then before you've given it nitrogen, fungicides, whatever? Why burn it? Why, why wait till June? And then there's the, the new techniques that are coming in, minimising seed return with harvest weed seed control. So black grass, what are its weaknesses? What are its strengths? 80% of it comes up in the autumn. That's a weakness. Although John has told us now that the English black grass has now started coming up this spring as well. 70% seed decline over the year. 
So we know that within five years, we can get rid of it in the seed bank. And it can't germinate from depth. So if we bury it deep, it won't germinate. It strengths our contamination. We talked about that. It's in seed, it's on your machines, it's in your balers, it's in your combines. High seed production. It loves wet conditions. Really wet, loves it, doesn't care. Your, your crop will fail, black grass will carry on. And then spring emerges, they do set seed. And if you've got a very poor crop and you harvest it, black grass will continue to grow in the stubble and set seed before you kill it off before your next crop. So there we are, 80% emerging in the autumn. So we can delay drilling. But cultural control, it's quite difficult to work. It can give you very variable results. It's not the answer to everything. You will always get some coming through because when you're tackling a, a 10 hectare field with, with a plough or a cultivator, you're not going to get all the soil work to an even depth. Influenced by weather conditions and this autumn, has been appalling. And I don't really want to suggest to you that you do late drilling because I think, you know, you, you'll beat me to death. Cultivations, associated costs. It's expensive, it's time consuming. We've talked about ploughing, but ploughing is very valuable. Once you've got a low product, uh, population, you can reduce the pressure on the herbicides. You get a better percentage control. You get fewer survivors. With the, with the herbicides, because it's just a numbers game, really. And then you're more lucky than some of the people in the east of England. You can return the field to grassland. A minimum of two years, but as long as you want. But you've got to mow or tightly graze that grassland so that the black grass does not set seed again. So you've got to stop it returning seed, because it will. <coughs> so this is... a. Uh, paper where they looked at a load of cultural techniques. This is sort of the only real information that we have. We've not really gone on to do additional work on controlling black grass with cultural methods. We've done a bit on spring, spring and a bit on um, cover crops. So ploughing, it gives us an average of 69% control of black grass, but it's variable. We know what ploughing is like. Um, it can be great or it can be rubbish. Depends on the conditions, depends on the ploughman. It's a technique, it's really important to get good ploughing. Delaying drilling, the weather. Higher seed rates, they do give you a little bit of control, so you get a more competitive crop, and you will have to up your seed rate if you drill late. Competitive cultivars, so we don't really look at varieties for their competitiveness, but I mean, changing from wheat to barley, that's a more competitive crop. But I wouldn't grow winter oats because they've absolutely failed. There's no herbicide you can use in them. I just They're supposed to be competitive, but they're not really. Spring cropping, that's the way the English have gone. Loads more spring cropping, mainly because they were forced with their arms up the back because they couldn't get stuff in in the autumn. And the, but they have learnt begrudgingly to grow spring crops to control black grass. And then following as well with um, the... Uh, environmental stewardship type things. More people have gone into fallowing, but I've seen some atrocious fallowing, full of black grass, took it out after two years, and the field was worse than when he started. So there's something to be learnt there. So we're looking at the seed bank. So this is the soil, basically the soil profile. So weeds generally come up from the top five centimetres or two inches. And then when you cultivate, you're stirring up this seed bank. So fresh seed is falling on the top, and you've got old seed in the bottom, up to sort of five, six years old. Germination is generally stimulated by cultivations, a flash of light, oxygen, change of temperature. But seeds on the surface are killed by insects, mice, birds, and then killed by sunshine and frost. And then some of the seed that's freshly shed becomes dormant and some dies. But black grass can emerge. Most of it comes from the top layers. But when you get below sort of six inches, six centimetres or two and a half inches, yeah, emergence really stops. So cultivations that give you uneven emergence, and that's probably what you don't need when you're using a pre-emergence herbicide. You want the seed to come from a, a tight layer at the top, the, the layer that's affected by the herbicide. You don't want it coming up from underneath because then it's not affected 
by the herbicide. So keeping those cultivations nice and even and tight. So with ploughing, this year's seed goes onto the top and you've got seeds in the seed bank. So with ploughing, you generally put the new seed at the bottom and you bring the old seed to the top. So you can see the problems there. If you haven't ploughed for five years, then you won't have any old seed at the bottom, so you'll have a nice clean top. But you ploughing every year, you're just moving it round, you're bringing it back up, going down, back up, going down. So ploughing is great. It reduces the weed pressure. You don't have to do it every year. As a one-off, it, it, it doesn't affect your organic matter. It doesn't affect your structure. Just as a one-off, resetting the system when you've got a high number, it's fine. Deep tilling. Now, this is the worst one. So you're deep tilling 10, 15 centimetres. You're just churning that soil up. You're spreading the seed through the depth of cultivation. Um, some new seed is buried, but basically you're just moving it around and it's coming up from different depths. So deep tilling is not, not the best way. Does so this ploughing convert compared with non-inversion? You can see that ploughing is a, a lot cleaner, non-inversion. But I mean, it depends what you want. If you're going to spray off that non-inversion with glyphosate, then that's what you need. With the ploughing, you would spray it off. So you always would kill before you drill. This is shallow tillage. So you're keeping that seed within that top layer. You know where that seed is. You're keeping it in there and you can control it. You'll know when it comes up and you'll be able to control it with a pre-emergence herbicide. With no till, you're keeping that soil on the top, the, the seed on the top. And so you know where it is and you'll be able to deal with it. So this is the option. You, you can keep it on for top from years, but if it gets too much, you can just plough it and then reset because you won't have many seeds underneath to bring up. So it keeps these weeds in the emergent zone. But as John mentioned, no, I think no-till, direct drilling. You buy one machine, you change your thing. You've got to be flexible. You've got to have that flexibility. You, I think you can't just set on one of these methods. You've got to be flexible and you've got to be prepared to change your cultivations. Because with no-till, direct drilling, brome loves, loves that. As Michael mentioned, we, we suffered that before. That germinates on the, the surface. Um, biennials, perennials, tap roots, Bircherville, things like that. And if you're not killing those um, tap roots, then it can cause issues and you may want to reset it. So just in summary, ploughing is good, deep tilling is probably the worst, shallow tilling is okay, and no till is good. So, 1st of June, first week of June is a uh, a date you should have in your mind. That's when you should kill off blackgrass. If you've got any blackgrass in your fields, you should be roguing it out and you should be removing it from the field. The 1st of June is basically the week that blackgrass starts to set seed in its head. So if you leave it in the field, you run the risk of it germinating. It's like wild oats. You would always take them from the field because they are fertile as soon as they appear. So spraying out patches, this is done with a hand sprayer, but you can do it with the 24 metre tractor, 36 metre, take out half the field, it doesn't really matter. But the first week of June really is the, the sort of last date that you can use it. And then roguing, this isn't fun at all. It's all right, wild oats, they're quite big and hefty and you can take them out, but looking for black grass is quite difficult. But it's well worth it if you want to go that way to getting rid of it. But then you've got to watch hygiene. So you don't want to be bringing um, new seeds onto the farm in balers, in combines, in seed, in um, whatever, whatever. You don't want to bring it back on. So you've got to watch that. So hygiene is really key. So we can use herbicides, that's fine. But we've got to make sure they work optimally. Fine seed beds, no large clods. Pre-emergence has always go on between 24 to 48 hours of drilling because we need to get those weeds as they germinate. Then we'd usually put on a peri-emergence and then a post-emergence in the autumn. But that's gone out of favour because our black wrist is resistant to them all, basically. Using the correct boom height, using reduced speed, using good coverage. 
and watching your um, the amount of water you use. So we have risk factors which we look at. So um, high risk factors are three or more grass weed herbicides per year. Pops and dims. Vijay's just talked about this. These are the sort of key one. The the ALS herbicides used every year, and then but always use a pre-emergent herbicide, and then learn from us what we're going to do after, because they don't work anymore, but we're working on that. Cultural risk factors always as well, so crop rotation, monocultures are bad, M multiple crops are good, spring sown crops, include them in the rotation because they are very valuable. Cultivation systems, just doing a monoculture, you've got to swap it about a bit. Drilling date, uh, high seed rates, competitive colours, uh, cultivars and fallow, just use loads and keep those weed levels low because the fewer weeds you have, the less um, problems you can have with multiplication and, and bringing out a resistance. So in summary, plan your weed control across the whole rotation. It's not just about the wheat, it's not just, it's, so you plan it across the whole rotation. You can use different herbicides and different cultivations, drilling dates throughout the rotation. Keep your weed populations low. Decide on what cultivations you're going to use and plan your drilling date. Kill before you drill using glyphosate and then plan your herbicide strategy. And, and then preferably don't let the weeds set seed. But if you haven't got two weeds in the first place, that's not going to be a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, going from a pint glass to four one-ton bags is a very impressive picture because it, it really hits at home well. So, um, so our last speaker for this session is Tom Chilcott from Bayer. So, Tom, uh, and then we'll have uh, Bill and Michael with two videos, uh, and then we'll have a, a session after that. Thanks, Tom. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, let's just get to the next presentation. So what I'm going to talk to you for the next 15 minutes is about herbicides from Bayer's point of view over the last 10, 20 years, I guess. So obviously there's a, there's a legacy, and I think what, there's a really good saying in agriculture that you, know, you don't inherit your land from your father, you, you, you gift it to the next generation. And actually, I think of the, of the weeds, pests, and diseases out there, disease, herbicides and weeds are one area that is really a legacy you can pass on or you control. And you can really see where you've been effective and where you've been ineffective over the last few years. And herbicides are really important. I think in regard to that, over the next 10 years, as we start to look forward, I think we're going to have some real challenges around the herbicide portfolio and how we use it effectively in our programs going forward. Now, luckily, with, um, with herbicides, Bayer's obviously been in a very fortunate position over the last 10 years, 15 years. And at the moment, Plufenacet and Mesosulfuron probably make up a huge foundation for a lot of you in, a, in, a, in your main crops. Uh, but actually, as a part of that, the responsibility also falls on Bayer to help steward that and manage that responsibly in the marketplace as well. And when I talk about that, we, what we do is we, we monitor for resistance. And we don't only obviously do that in Ireland, we do that around Europe as a whole. And I think sometimes it's good when we're having a conversation around resistance and herbicide actually to discuss actually what's happening further afield. Sometimes there's comfort in knowing what is happening elsewhere. Now, as a part of that, Bayer obviously look at resistance around Europe and monitor the performance of our herbicides around Europe. And I think that gives us a privileged position. And I think when I say performance, read into this, we obviously do a lot of trials uh, year in, year out around our products. But there's a core set of trials that we do and my legal team's not here, so you can read into that the word complaint monitoring, uh, around how these perform and how your feedback is with these. And that's really important for you understanding how to develop these programs and use these products effectively going forward. I'm not going to dwell on the bottom. And this comes in to what we call our, our Weed Research Competency Center, and this does all our testing for us. On the bottom left-hand side is a graph that Sarah showed that actually, obviously, the impact that weeds do have, and this is looking at ryegrass. But on the right-hand side here is starting to look at the data that comes in from Bayer around Europe around where we're taking resistance samples. Okay, and obviously, although a huge part of what you grow is cereals, when we look further afield in Europe, 
Obviously, corn starts to become a massive crop. Soya starts to feature in there as well. And this looks at all resistant samples coming in from all crops. But also, with this, we can start to look at some of the trends that are happening in the industry. And what we can start to see here is that there is a massive disproportion of samples coming in from winter cereals, or winter cropping, full stop. But winter cereals are, are high in there. So you can obviously see the impact that is having on where we're finding and where these challenges are coming in. One of the interesting things, you know, I look at what you guys are doing compared to probably what is happening in the UK is actually you have actually more spring cereals than you do have winter cereals. And when you start to look at this data, that's obviously a really positive thing. Sarah mentioned before, actually, maybe we could learn something from you in the UK. And I think this probably is one of the major areas that we've been real laggards over the last few years because what we've chosen to do in the UK is focus on the margin element. And actually, because of the herbicides we've had over the last 10 years, we've been fortunate enough that we can keep focusing on the crops that deliver margin rather than what delivers long-term weed control and, and efficacy longer term. Okay, so you can see on the right-hand side, lots coming in from winter cereals. When we start to break that down, we can start to look at the samples of weeds submitted in those, in those two cropping types. So for summer, reed spring effectively. But what you can see here at the moment for the summer cereals, the springs, or for spring cropping, a huge proportion of weeds are in that list. It's a really long list, especially when we get to the next one. It's a big list there, you know, and actually at the top of it, this is the Bayer Coast, but the top, Amaranthus, that's a broadleaf weed, okay? It's lolium comes in second, so that's your ryegrass is coming in second. If we look at winter cereals, submission from winter cereals, Actually, you can see the top five are all grasses, and they are disproportionately ryegrass and blackgrass. We then start to get the bents coming in below, but you can see nearly 80%, 73% of weeds submitted in the top three are grasses, and they make 73% of all the samples submitted. So we can start to see that winter cereals or winter cropping is a, is a challenging area for us, and probably no surprise to you as well, grasses are a real challenge within that as well. Okay, And yeah, so you can see of all the samples submitted here, ranked from top to bottom, you know, ryegrass consistently comes out top for most countries in terms of challenging and in most cropping scenarios. But also you can see actually those top three, ryegrass, blackgrass and bents, that's 73% of all samples submitted. Okay, So we can start to see the what in terms of grasses and which grasses are starting to present a real challenge for us around Europe and we can see where they're becoming a challenge for us around Europe as well. And that's important to take forward when we start to think around the future of herbicides as well. So just to, to cross-reference this as well, obviously Bayer does its own sampling, but there's obviously databases around the world as well. So from the Weed Science Institute as well, we can start to see which areas or which, which genuses and species of plants do rank as the highest or most high risk in terms of generating a, a, a target site or an enhanced metabolism to herbicides. And at the top, we've got Poaceae. Next, we've got the Astriaceae, but then we've got Brassicas. And I think Astriaceae is, that's corn marigold. So I think that's a real challenge for you as well. So we can of start to see our, your problem weeds start to fall into the high risk zones that we can appreciate around the world, them happening. And then also, we can start to see where the number of resistant species are by crop. And again, Looking at wheat, you can take corn out there as well, but if you have wheat and further down winter wheat and spring barley, you can see that cereals are a really ch real challenge. And I think as we progress through over the next sort of five minutes, we'll see that obviously you are growing the crops that are presenting probably the highest risk to, to growers, and that's around the world. That's a worldwide database, not just a UK or a European wide database, but also where those, go, where those risk factors are coming in in terms of winter and spring as well, okay? But also the challenge here as well going forward is herbicides themselves delivering activity in these areas. Now, if we look at herbicides, and obviously they're making up and we're using them prevalently at the moment, the first herbicide was discovered in 1933 and it was basically an analog of 2,4-D. And over the next... 20 years or 30 odd years, we had 10 new MO modes of action. That's not just actives, that's different modes of action. And then the 20 years after that, from 1960 to 1980, we had 12 modes of action discovered. 
And then since from 1980 or 1981, I won't ask you because it's a big room and I know people, but if you think of a figure in your head, how many modes of action have been discovered, think of that figure, I bet it wasn't one. We've had one mode of action discovered since 1982. And I think longer term, we're talking 2030 onwards, we're starting to address this, not only Bayer, but the industry as a whole. But I think we've got some lean years coming and we don't have new modes of action coming in the near future. Bear in mind that that mode of action discovered recently is not for cereals, it's for rice. So it's not something that we're going to be using in our cropping of the future for the next 10 years. So there's a real lack of genuinely new modes of action and it's the modes of action that are important rather than just the actives themselves. But yeah, since 1982. And therefore actually, I think one of the key takeaway messages going forward around everything that's been discussed today is obviously all, all the cultural practices are really important, but they're only going to become more important. But how we manage and use herbicides is going to become a real challenge, I think, going forward as well, and something that we have to make a real priority. I think for the last 10 years, we've had the luxury of pro products like Fufenacet and Miso to a certain extent that have delivered really effective and crop safe controls quite easily in all your crops. You know, whether it be spring, whether it be wheat, whether it be barley, and to a certain extent, oats in the UK on an emu, you know, it's successfully achieved that across all that spectrum. That is going to become more difficult, I think, going forward. But just to give you an idea, so this is an overview, and this is an industry overview, not just a, a, a Bayer overview, and therefore it's aimed as a guide rather than a, a, an index of what is going to happen. But I recognize that at the back you won't see everything, but this outlines all the different actives currently sold by major sort of R&D manufacturers in the UK, so, or in Europe. So you've got Miso at the top, you've got Flufenacet and Metribuzin in there. And what you can see is in the blue is where it's currently registered. In orange, where we're likely to expect it to go through re-registration in Europe over the next few years. There's, a, there's three green bars on there. Two of them are the same product. That's Bix's own coming with Bayer and FMC. And you've obviously got Simethylin, which is in the UK, but not yet in BASF. Uh, sorry, not yet in Ireland from BASF. What you should see is actually there's quite a lot of oranges there. And those orange bars represent an unknown factor. And we do expect a lot of those actives that we take for granted at the moment probably will see over the next five to eight years a dose reduction in their use rate in the UK and European level. And obviously, once we start to reduce some of the use rates of these products, then also the efficacy of these products and what they deliver starts to fall away as well. And not only does it start to fall away, it starts to become selective for the different weeds as well. It doesn't drop away equally on all weeds. So as we lose dose rates on some products, that might mean they maintain their efficacy on brome, but not quite so much on the rye grasses or black grasses, for instance. I think the key point to take away, though, is that makes it more difficult because as we go forward and as you are presented with weed species in the field, your program for the last few years has been fairly comfortable, probably based around Flufenacet and a tank mix partner. Actually, we're going to have to start choosing the building blocks depending on the weed species because of the lower dose rates that we have active to. The other important consideration around this is obviously as we put tank mix partners in with products, they're managing to a certain extent to a certain extent, uh, the resistance mechanisms that are being expressed in the field. And they allow us to, to steward the products and steward the mode of actions we have. As those dose rates reduced, our ability to steward these actives also diminishes to a certain extent as well. So how we use them becomes even more important because actually how you build a tank mix will have an impact on the long-term effectiveness of your herbicide programs on your farm. So... Reduce rates, loss of active, as I mentioned. I think the important thing is we have three actives coming, and I, I've chosen a, a footballer rather than a rugby player today, but I think the aim here is hopefully you'll still recognise him as Lionel Messi. As we get the new actives, Bixlazone and Simethylin from Basef, the key here is that a star doesn't make a team. You know, it's great having new actives, and that's something that, you know, the industry desperately needs, but we do need the tank mix partners as well to actually maintain the efficacy of these products longer term, because otherwise we will be asking just too much of individual products to deliver the control that we've been experiencing. And what, you know, taking something from John's talk earlier, 
What you should be aware of as well, we're already selecting for resistance, even though some of these products aren't even being sold currently on the marketplace. We're still selecting for them with the chemistry we're currently using. So we have to be really mindful around how we put these programs and these products together. Now, just quickly, obviously, if we've only got two new actives really coming on the horizon, Bixazone and Symethylene, and obviously what we have is a diminishing toolkit or a reduced toolkit around what we currently have, actually our aim obviously is to use them as effectively and as efficiently as possible in the marketplace. And the reality is, is actually I also think that is likely to become a bit more of a challenge in the near future as well. Okay, so just quickly, obviously, and this to a certain extent I think it's more for you guys than it is for me in the UK, but actually as part of the European Union, we have the Green Deal coming. Uh, and they obviously have some targets in there, and a couple of key targets at the top are to reduce pesticide use or chemical pesticide use by 50%, but also to reduce hazardous pesticides by 50%. Understand what a hazardous pesticide is, I guess, will be a challenge, because actually hazard is something that I'm sure individual countries will take an independent decision on anyway. So actually understanding what this legislation means for us or means for you guys in Europe going forward is difficult to quantify. The one thing it will do, I can guarantee, is have an impact on the herbicides we have access to and their use rates going forward as well. And my final one I would also point out is interesting as well in the fact that obviously also within the European Union we have further legislation around microplastics. Uh, so, and microplastics are basically a polymer and they are used extensively in herbicides. And so there's other legislation out there that is going to have an impact on herbicides that probably you haven't been, maybe not been aware of or paying attention to at the moment because we think it's long distant past or future. But as part of the microplastics legislation coming forward, you know, the bottom one is that microplastics will be eliminated, eliminated from plant protection products by 2031. I think there's a key point here in A, you'll be amazed at how many microplastics are used in our products, not only in terms of capsule and formulations, um, but also especially in stuff like the surf surfactants as well that go in to make these herbicides work really well. And I'm sure, you know, if you've spoken to a Bayer colleague over the last 10 years or last five years with Monsanto and glyphosate, actually some of the things that differentiate Roundup from everything else is the surfactants and the systems that go into it. A lot of them rely on microplastics. And so actually, to even keep a lot of the herbicides we've got and currently have, there actually has to be a massive investment in R&D to re-engineer the formulation so that we can continue to use them post-2031. Uh, and actually, that's a, a big consideration for the companies like Bayer and Syngenta and Basef, but also what we have to be conscious of is that is only ever going to take funding away from other projects as well, because actually the R&D investment in some of this is actually quite significant. So it will have an impact on the pipeline uh, and what we can do with our products going forward as well. Um, just sort of bringing it to, to an end. So obviously Europe has had a, you know, it does have fluid policy at the moment. And actually I think a couple of things I've highlighted are interesting because not only do they present a challenge in terms of actually how we, we develop our products going forward, but also the risk appetite for companies like Bayer also becomes more challenging because you don't know what the investment cycle is going to be like. Bear in mind, a lot of these products take 10 years to easily develop a formulation, get it through registration and to the market like you. If you don't have a clear sight for the next 10 years of what's going to happen, obviously that starts to, to change the business case for companies like Bayer and therefore the investment and what also comes out of pipelines. You know, realistically, we've had, you know, two new actives coming into cereals. They're not new in terms of being discovered, but they are new to cereals. That's important. We have to make the most of them. But also, in making the most of them, we have to defend them to the best of our ability, and that's really important. Other than that, we don't have any genuinely new mode of actions coming over the horizon until at least the 2030s. We're going to lose actives, reduce actives. That's going to have an impact on how you deliver control and it is something I would advocate that we take seriously from now because actually there's no point doing it once it's happened. That will be too late. And the reality is when it does happen in the future, it's likely to be something, it's going to be harder to claw back success from that point because we won't have the strength of options we've currently got. Stewardship is more and more important. It will always become more and more important. Uh, and, you know, Bayer takes this role really responsible, but it is something I'd advocate. Over time, I think what we'll see 
is also code forms will become harder to register as well, and therefore you will have the individual building blocks. So instead of having Flufenacet and DFF together in a code form, you might have Flufenacet and a product of DFF, and therefore the responsibility for you to steward these products will only increase as well. Defending these actors is important. And like I said, actually, I think a real thing to bear in mind going forward is actually how this affects the investment cycle for the future. You know, there is an awful lot of investment Bayer and our competitors are going to have to do just effectively to stand still over the next five to ten years. Uh, and that's not to be underestimated in how it impacts everything else that a company like ourselves operates. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, so now we have two short videos, uh, one uh, from Bill Shanahan, Kilmack in, in West Waterford, and then we've got uh, Michael Grace from Plain and Kildare. I guess we're going to see Michael getting into his car again and telling us about the videos, the start of the videos. So. Hello, my name is Michael Hennessy. In this series of videos, Shea Phelan, Kieran Collins and I will visit farmers who are working with the Enable Conservation Tillage Project over the last five years. We will visit these farms throughout the year to see how they're getting on using their establishment system, but also to see how they're controlling grass weeds in these systems, of which some of the weeds are problematic on many of the farms. Bill Shanahan and my son James, we farm here in Kilmac Thomas, County Watford, in the mid County Watford, between the Cumber Mountains and the uh, sea, of course. And um, we've been here for generations. We did about eight years or so, we uh, more or less stopped ploughing and uh, started using this machine here behind us, which is a deep loosener, but it's not a plough, really. Yeah. The other weed that you have here is black grass. I thought it was a kind of a, a different variety of scotch grass or something because it kind of spread similarly, you know, and it was getting worse and worse and, um, and nobody was able to identify it until uh, Kieran Collins immediately knew what it was when he saw it. So we were, we were delighted to be, have an answer for it anyway. Uh, so since then we've been working with uh, Tagash uh, in Oak Park to uh, look at the best way of um, dealing with the situation. Will you ever be rid of it? Worst case situation, we might put that field back into grass if we have to, but we want to try and, can, we want it to stay in uh, cropping if possible. On each farm, the ECT project selected a field with a high weed burden to monitor management practice. The ECT project staff used a grid methodology to count weeds each year before harvest. The results reflected how successful or not the weed control measures worked. On the map, squares coloured blue or green have a low weed population and squares coloured orange or red have a high weed population. Did you adjust the, of, the, of the rates of barley? Did you adjust it up by 10 or 15 percent, did you? Well, initially we were using standard rates, which I, I suppose in old terms would have been, you know, 11 or 12 stone. Uh, so we uh, took the route then that we would plant the barley at, <clears throat> in, again in old terms, 14 stone an acre, so that there'd be a lot more competition and a lot less light getting to the black grass. And in 2021, something similar, actually less again. And it does appear to be getting better. So even in, uh, and, and we'll, we'll have to do the count still this year, but even in 2022, where you were trying your best to do everything in it, mm. some parts of the field are certainly better, there's none in some parts, but there's still a level there. Well, we know the one that we have is resistance, has resistance to all uh, normal grass weed killers used in cereal growing. So we're, we're very compromised in that respect. Really to make any impact on the populations of the black grass, we really would, at this stage, uh, you're confined to spring cropping, which would be a spring cropping with a good canopy on it that will hinder the development of the grass weeds, the black grass weeds as they're growing in the spring. You don't want to have an open crop, that's the last word that you could last in. Do you think you might have to change in certain areas to, if you have black grass, to do something very different? It would appear, I think, that, you know, if you have black grass, 
receding it back into brass is probably the best option in the long run. That in a serial rotation or any arable rotation, it's not possible to get 100% control and uh, reduce it to such a level that you're eventually going to get rid of it altogether. Possibly grass would be the best option, I would think. I'm Michael Grace. I'm a tillage farmer from Clane County Gildare. I farm using a strip till system and I'm on mostly medium soils. Uh, average rainfall for this area is about 850 millimetres. What motivated you to change away from a plough based system to a strip till based system? Um, I had seen a demonstration of it working and liked what I saw and I wasn't particularly happy with you know, the conventional road and my yields were stagnating. Um, the soil was in a poor enough condition, low organic matter, um, no kind of no real life in it. One of the things, um, differences between our system and say conventional, your 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 advice to go so a bit earlier, so that obviously can lead to uh, grass weeds becoming uh, you know established earlier. So uh, so Michael, in terms of the, the system, how does it work? The combine rolls out of the field. Uh, what do you do from there to, to you get the next crop in? Uh, once the field is cleared. Um, you come in and give it a shallow cultivation with a disc and... So what depth? An inch or so? Two about inches? About that, yeah. Okay. Um, you will leave it then, you'll spray it off as close to sowing as possible. If it's a, an autumn, you know, if you're going in in the autumn, if it's the, if it's left for a spring crop, I'd come, you know, I'd try and get a second, uh, second stay of seabed, so I'd spray it off at some stage over the, sure. over the, over the winter and uh, try and disc it again for, a, for, a, for another, another, okay. another, Stills, and the type of machine you were a strip till system, the type of machine you went for is a Clayton. Yes. But well, describe how it works. Um, it doesn't cultivate all of the, you know, your three meter width or whatever your drill width is. It, 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 there's a leading leg and it comes along and puts a deep maybe. You can set it whatever you want, four to six inches. Sure. Um, and that's and it helps with drainage. And then there's a shallower time coming behind it and the seed falls in behind it and uh, there's after harvest then to co co cover it And over. you're rolling after and you're, that you, then you, well. you, would, you would roll after it, yeah, always. The idea okay. is to roll it. And so far so good, worked reasonably well in terms of establishing the crop? It'll take a certain amount of, of, of stickiness and you know, not, okay. not ideal, but it wouldn't want to be you know, really, really poor now where you'd be, you'd have to do it again, but it, it, it works. I've learned to know when to leave it in the shed. From the validation field, when we first uh, met up around the validation field in 2018, it came out of uh, spring beans, yes. and then it went into winter wheat, winter then, wheat. In, in 2019. Yeah, it's kind of where we we picked it up, and even in 2019, we can see you know there were some areas uh, of rome down, areas. down here, down, yeah. down around the bottom corner. So in 2021, so that was your winter barley, barley. so you were destined then for winter, winter oil seed rape. I uh, didn't get the straw cleared off the field in time. I went late and I just decided not to, uh, you know, I decided that it wasn't going to soil seed rape. So I went with, I, I, I said I'd chance another year of winter barley. Okay. I was expecting it to be fair, but you know, I. The broom levels had increased for in 20 or last year for 2022. Was there anything that you learned from that in particular that you kind of thought I'd definitely be sticking with that? Well, there certainly was. Um, vigilance um, is, is, is key. You, you know, you can't ever think you have. You know, you've got on top of it. Um, but I, I've learned to manage it once you use the, the tools that I've, I've learned. You know, there's rotation is, is absolutely underpins the whole thing. You have to rotate. I put in a grass margin there on a headland that the, that the cereal brome is coming out from, and that has helped. So you have to be you have to be willing to try things. What would the two or three key things that you would you would say that you really must take this in consideration if you're starting? If you're thinking of starting or changing your system, um, I would certainly only only change over in a you know in, in a good year uh, weather-wise. Um, there's no point in starting in a in a wet autumn um, and Second thing I would, major thing I would consider is um, if you start sowing of a certain week of the year, you can start with this system. You can maybe start two weeks earlier in the autumn and for springtime, don't 
you know, let, let fields dry out, maybe leave it a little later than you would be normally doing and you know, just get the, get the conditions right. If you're not in a crop rotation, you'll have to start because it won't, it will break down within a couple of years. You're going to have to incorporate rape or beans or both into a crop rotation. It's the break crop that will get, help you get your, num your grass weed numbers down that you can you know, continue growing your, your cereal crops. Okay, so I'll, uh, Vijay, Sarah, and uh, Tom, and Bill, and Michael, if you can join me up here on the stage, please. Um, and I should say that uh, within the, the booklet that you would have got today, you would have seen all these case studies of, of the farmers in the ECT project. They're, they're, they're excellent. Uh, they're very informative, very easy to read, and they capture a lot of the comments that, that were there as well. Again, if you have any questions, please put up your hands. There's Kieran who's going around with the microphone there, and Shay for people who are online as well. Please send in the questions uh, via Zoom. So I suppose I'm going to start out. Um, Bill and Michael, you're, you're being extremely honest, as we heard this morning from the other farmers as well. Um, I'm curious, you know, in, in terms of all the control measures that you've had to adopt, it's a case-by-case -case situation. Did you get much... Uh, queries uh, from your own local farmers, local network, uh, you know, where your farm is based, your neighbours inquiring because they, maybe they weren't involved in the ECT project, but maybe they had similar issues, they became aware of it through, through yourselves in terms of the control and, and all the other problems. Bill, maybe yourself first. Uh, <clears throat> there wouldn't be much tillage now where I am, to be honest, and um, <clears throat> black grass wouldn't be a widespread problem right. either. Yeah. Well, not... Not really, no yeah, and, to that and you, question. You mentioned in, in, in your video there that, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of going into grass if, if things get, get really serious. I think that putting it back into grass is the only way you're really going to control it. It's, it's the, the ultimate. Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And then, Michael, from, from your side of things... Um, <clears throat> broom would be my biggest issue, and it's an issue for plenty of farmers around me, so... Yeah. I suppose when I changed over to the system, I had a, you know, plenty of people asked me about mm. how I was getting on and stuff. And yeah, a lot of curiosity. And with, 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 with the discussion group I'm in, like just from having from drop there. walks and you know, meeting people and talking about everyone talking about their yeah. experiences, you, you, yeah. you learn things. And I mean, you, you both talk about machine hygiene. We heard yeah. about it this morning. You know, uh, and I, I, I would say it's easy to talk about. It's very hard to very do. Very hard right. to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can blow down a combine as much as you want, there'll still be. It's still going to. If you've come out of a field with with uh, whatever whatever it is, wild oats or broom, they're going yeah. to be there no matter how yeah. well you clean it, and you will bring. I think you will bring a certain amount with you. Yeah, next exactly. Field. And and I guess it's it's about de-risking. About you know every, all these things help. Yeah. But as you say, but if if the you don't do the, it, the, the more of an effort you make, the better. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. You have to minimize it as much as, yeah. as you can. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, Sarah, you, you were talking there about, obviously, the, the need for vigilance and, and particularly flexibility uh, in rotations and, and not, to, not to rule out, out anything. I suppose you've seen the weather we've had this autumn. Uh, it, you know, if we were having a really good autumn, flexibility is in a different context. But now when you have that sort of situation and, and the uncertainty of the weather patterns, it makes it very difficult. Um, and you mentioned over in, in the UK, obviously, lessons that are being learned. So, I mean, how, in, in terms of the flexibility of the rotations, from your perspective, you know, how flexible are farmers in, in regards to black grass and in regard to other grass weeds? I think a lot, they make a lot of the choices on, on profitability. Of and so grass weed control would come second. But, uh, yeah. Okay. And Vijay, you mentioned there were... You, you meant you showed your slide on, on glyphosate. Um, you had the control of, I think it was Italian ryegrass and black grass, and you had up to eight, 810 mm. grams, I think it was. Just to be clear, is that's compliant for on stubble? Is that correct? Yeah, so glyphosate is uh, only herbicide uh, that the rate varies from as low as 270 to as high as uh, 1,440. We have seen from our uh, uh, survey where uh, but more than 70% of the farmers are using um, higher rates, mm. uh, 8, 10 or above, whereas uh, still there are uh, 30 or more than 30% still use lower rates. So that's why we wanted to do and see uh, what rates would 
give effective control. Effective and we've, control. We found more than 720. I think uh, in the UK, the, the recommendation is above 720s. Yeah, I mean, sort of 720 yeah. upwards. Yeah. yeah, okay. Shay, anything from your side? Yeah, a couple of questions here, you and uh, First one is probably for VJ in terms of the levels of glyphosate that you were shown in the trials. Are the higher rates uh, compliant with Department of Agricultural Regulations in terms of label rates? You're using above label rates, I think, in some of them, aren't you? So, uh, on the label for stubbles, it's a 1.5 liter uh, per hectare of 360 gram product. If you have a perennial crop, I think you can go for, uh, I suppose you can go for an higher rate. Yeah, uh, second I mean, question. Perennial beets, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Second question then, I presume, is for either Tom or, or, or Sarah. Maybe a comment from both. It's about the cost benefit analysis of using multiple uh, herbicide applications. So, stacking your herbicides to control black grass, how cost effective or sustainable is it? I'll take that first one then. Sure. Uh, to be honest, it will always be dependent on the, on the level of infestation you've got, it's been the first thing. You know, I think if you go back to the graph that both Sarah and myself shared, you know, if you get up to 500 heads a square meter, then, you know, the impact on yield is colossal. Now, the reality is that's probably an unsustainable situation and actually herbicides are never going to get you out of that. You need to go back into grass or something else. So it's always something you're going to have to weigh up whatever your farming scenario is, to be honest. Um, but ultimately, I think as an easy answer. The answer is yes, it does stack up. It depends at what point it starts to fall away because the infestation is too big. Yeah. Yeah, so there's always a trade-off, but there, yeah. there is a, a trigger point where you're yeah. going to have to make the decision. Sorry, just a, a question, here. Yeah, go ahead, Salim. Firstly, I'd like to con uh, congratulate Chagas for having this is a really good event. But most of all, I'd like to congratulate or say thank you to the farmers who've gone up on that stage there today to discuss a problem that's been buried too long. I'd like to ask Sarah and VJ in particular, what's the your experiences of multi-species contamination in the one plot, in the one farm, the one field. I'm talking about species that ALSs may control and won't control in the one farm. All right, DJ. So I guess it's basically worst case scenario, everything is there. Sorry, sorry, I didn't really get the question, sorry. So I, I think if I understand correctly, the, the question is like, what do you do in a scenario where you have, the worst case scenario, you have multiple grass weeds, multiple resistant profiles, and they're all in, for argument's sake, in the same field? Yeah. The, the, uh, is that? I, I, I maybe go just a bit further. From my experience of it, and I've worked a fair bit with it, I've come across black grass situations where there are species within the one field, there are different species, you can control some of them, or more of them continue to grow. Have you any experience or comment on that? Have you come across that feature in your testing? So you, you mean multiple resistant species? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we have... D different population within the same crop. Yeah, we have, uh, like I showed uh, in one of the map uh, about the uh, prevalence of herbicide resistant grass weeds, where we saw three farms having uh, the multiple resistant population, like uh, some of the farms had uh, both uh, resistant black grass and resistant Italian dry grass. But surprisingly, the, those population was uh, still be able to control in a non serial break crop situation with the likes of Century and Max. But if you have no option uh, for chemical control, obvious option is to go for uh, the, the grass, uh, grass lay, uh, you know, because. And, and it, the decision is based on how widespread is the population. Of course, you have the glyphosate, you can, uh, you can rely on a curb. Uh, but other than that, the option is uh, quite limited. Okay. Okay. <coughs> I asked Sarah about, I mentioned the weather, but for Bill and Michael yourselves, I mean, you're at the cold <coughs> face of it. So this autumn, you know, obviously hasn't, say it hasn't been easy is an understatement. So, I mean, when, when you're looking at thinking about the rotation, but you're also thinking about grass weed control on top of that. So it's another layer of complexity. So, I mean, obviously you've been involved in the project for five years now, but do you go forward, have confidence, or you have, you're, more, you're more aware, obviously, but obviously you have more confidence in, in how to control these things. But vigilance, I guess, is key from what you're saying. <clears throat> it's very hard to st stop black grass spreading from one field to the other. 
with the combine and stuff like that. So you have to be very vigilant, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, do you, do you become, have you noticed even over the last four or five years, you've become, I wouldn't say paranoid about it, but I mean, I guess you have to be up at that level where you're constantly keeping an eye out. And you mentioned, one of you mentioned zero tolerance as well earlier on. I think paranoid is a very apt word. Yeah. Okay. Michael? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. You have, to, um, you have to do all you can, really, to, mm. to, to minimise it. And as regards, you know, this autumn, I think everyone's plans of what they had planned and what they'd actually end up doing will have changed. You just have to be prepared to, to adapt and do yeah. the best you can. Yeah, yeah. as I say, be all of as the scouts, be prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Tom, you, you mentioned in your last slide there about microplastics. So one would hope that you mentioned, obviously, if that's going to be, you're looking at reformulations to get, a, get past that, that new legislative challenge. But herbicides are a key part of, of integrated weed management. So, you know, I suppose the, the, your story was, was, had hope in it until that last bit, which was like almost a, a hand trip in the ankle when you're saying that possibly certain chemistries may not be available, or the, the reformulation is going to take time and reinvestment, etc. Yeah, ultimately, I mean, we've got to a situation where what you want from a herbicide to a certain extent and from a formulation is it to actually be stable. One of the challenges, obviously, around, and therefore, actually, what we don't want it to do is biodegrade too quickly in the environment. Of course. You know, that can be seen as a negative. Actually, microplastics obviously allow us the, to achieve that. Mm. If you take that away and what you ultimately want in whatever replaces it, it is it for it to become biodegradable, mm. obviously then its stability is a trade-off in yeah, that. Good. So it's actually a very challenging thing for our formulation chemists and our competitors' formulation chemists to achieve something that retains enough stability that you can put it in a can for two years, leave it on a shelf, and it can be exposed to 20 degrees and minus 5 degrees. But then as soon as you apply it into a, onto a field, obviously degrades very quickly and doesn't have any long-lasting effects in the environment. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, from my side, I think what I don't want you to, or what I want you to appreciate to a certain extent, actually, I think, is there is going to be a huge level of investment just to stand still. Right. And it might feel like what we're doing is standing still, but that doesn't mean in the background, companies like Bayer, Syngenta and Basef There's aren't doing an awful there. lot of work just to keep what we've currently got. And like I said, if you look at the regulatory future of some of those products, keeping what we've currently got is needed with yeah. the future, basically. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Shay, one last question. Yeah, then. just one for Sarah um, Ewan. Um, she mentioned already there about living with blackgrass. How realistic do you think it is where you have a significant blackgrass problem you think that you can eliminate it in a tillage rotation? So can you eliminate a blackgrass problem in a tillage rotation, in your experience? You can definitely reduce your blackgrass population significantly within a tillage rotation. There's plenty of herbicides that, that will kill it. Some of them are a bit more fussy, like propizamide in oilseed rape. Um, but yes, you can use multiple methods of, of getting rid of it. So it is possible. Right. But, but then I guess you need to be aware that it's going, it might come back, and there's a good chance it probably will come back. So... So when, it, when it's elimination, it's not gone forever, obviously. The risk is going to be always remain. Yeah. And you, you can, maybe Bill might give a bit of his experience as well in terms of trying to eliminate black grass in a tillage rotation. How difficult is it? Our black, <coughs> excuse me, our black grass is resistant to all the chemicals, so we can only rely on cultivation and Roundup. Okay, so look, I, I just want to reiterate Liam's comment, I mean, to, to Bill and Michael and all the farmers involved in ECT. It, the project wouldn't have had the impact, actually the project wouldn't have delivered without the farmers um, and their honesty and availability of sites. So I want to thank the panel, Tom, Sarah and, and Vijay and also the farmers. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to head into the last session. Michael is going to wrap things up with, I suppose, the main messages um, of the project. And thanks, folks. Um, and then I think we're, we're breaking then shortly thereafter. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thanks. thanks very much. And before everybody goes, can I just ask everybody to do me a favour, uh, to do the project a favour, um, and it's really important both for, for us, uh, both, in, both in terms of our um, funders and in terms of uh, an evaluation at the very end. There's, a, there's an ECT um, survey there. So as you're listening to me for the next five minutes, you might just fill that in. It's really important that you do that. And for any of our Zoom people are on, on, online, I'm going to send this out to everybody as well. Um, it's something that our funders will be looking towards to see whether we had any effect or impact, if you like, and, and a survey like this will, will, will certainly help, I think, within that end of it. Um, I think Bill, even though he had very few words to say at the very end in terms of black grass, is probably born out of frustration, I think, in terms of trying to control it. I think if you got anything as regards to the comments that Bill, Bill came out on, basically, he's exactly what the, the, his population, to no fault of his own, but the population that he has there is exactly the population we do not want in any farms. It is fully resistant. He's bunched, basically, in terms of a rotation uh, or, or trying to put anything different other than spring barley on that, and he will not get control. Or we've tried really, really, really hard. Bill has tried really, really hard to try and get control of black grass in that, in that position. And it's just, it's just not doable. It's, it's, there's always going to be a few heads there. And as Sarah says, there's not too many heads. You don't need money to, uh, to repopulate that, far, that, that, that field and essentially that farm thereafter. So, um, so look, in terms of a few uh, sum up remarks, uh, in terms of, of uh, the project itself. So <clears throat> main messages, I suppose. The first one and foremost one really is that, look, all tillage systems can operate very successfully uh, bike and keep grass weeds to a minimum. But that, that takes work. It takes a lot of work and vigilance to be able to do that. Because, look, grass weeds are an increasing problem, um, but the non-plough non tillage farmers do some things really well, but as you can read there, it's still more difficult to control grass weeds because probably, probably primarily for the fact that they're trying to sow that little bit earlier in the autumn time. It's given those really problematic weeds a bit more of a chance to get up and get going. And that's kind of the big thing, big thing for that. Um, <clears throat> in terms of herbicide resistance, I don't need to tell you much more other than what you've heard. It is increasing, uh, it is a, is a, is a serious problem. And it's probably two things that people maybe just don't really understand. And it's come through uh, a number of the farms we've worked with, um, in, including Bill, and he, and he says it in the video, maybe not in the, the, the snippet you've seen there, but he says it, uh, and uh, another one of our farmers says it as well, we have obligations now in terms of rotation, uh, that if you can't rotate around there, you're going to be bunched in terms of crop diversification, in terms of your BIS application, and you're going to be bunched in terms of rotating your uh, individual parcel numbers if you can't rotate out of that. And Bill is going to run, run into that one as well if he continues with spring barley. He has to rotate into something else. So that's, that's the other implication of it. It's not just that on its own. Never mind cost and everything else. Um, the main message really is be vigilant. Know the weed that you have. We've produced enough material there to fell three forests, but there's enough stuff to bring home for sure. And there's lots of identification books there. We have um, a few other um, uh, small, I suppose, cards really to help you identify the weeds. First thing is identify the weed. The second thing is, if you don't know what it is, ask somebody who does. And if you think they don't know, ask somebody else. Make sure you get that weed identified really, really well. Spotting it early, pulling those one or two weeds or 10 weeds or 20 weeds, or even uh, doing crop destruction in a quarter of an acre, an acre, two acres, and we have some of our farms who have done that, to try and stop that weed set. That is so important. That is the best money you're ever going to spend. Absolutely best money you're ever going to spend to try and do that. So be really, really aggressive. And for, for, for people not just who have um, some of these grass weeds on their farms, but who are contractors are coming in, and I suppose it is a message to contractors as well, we just do need to spend that hour or two hours cleaning down combines, going from one field to the next. And again, maybe perhaps for the contractors as well. And I think to, to a degree for the agronomists out there, because it's not just down to contractors or farmers. Agronomy, agronomists have a big part to play in this. Where there are problems on farms, you really do need to tell people that it's there. You really need to, from the area that you're working in, to make sure it stays there that you don't have a farmer who's traveling 20 miles one direction, 20 miles the other direction, and he's spreading stuff around the place everywhere. So, um, in terms of our farmers, and, and, and you've only heard from a few of our farmers today, five of the 10 farmers today, 
Um, but the messages, I suppose, are, are, are relatively consistent, I suppose, be, across all of those farmers in terms of the big messages that they're actually uh, good enough to, to do. But I think the first thing to say is, and, and, uh, and again, I'm going to go back to Bill, because I think he was very brave. He was the bravest man in the country to stick up his hand five years ago and said, I have black grass. There wasn't another person in the country who was doing it. We had people hiding in the corners, pretending they didn't have black grass, and uh, basically just... You know, just spreading it, basically. But in fairness to Bill, he put up his hand and he says, give me a hand to try and solve this problem. And he, you know, he, he, he let people in uh, to his farm and he shares his experiences. And I think that is massively valuable for the industry. And he deserves a huge amount of applause and a huge amount of thanks for doing that. Because we learned a lot as well, for sure. I think all of them are going to say, and you've heard him saying it over and over again, that rotation is essential. It's got to be a rotation that, that encompasses winter and spring, that encompasses non-cereal break crops as well into it. So you get this diversity of um, trying to exploit the, the, the weed biology in one side of it, but also allows you to use different mode of, modes of action as, as, as you go in it. But that only works to a degree if you, don't, if you give up uh, on, on hand roguing and you don't do hand roguing or crop destruction, ultimately you're going to be bunched. Um, both Simon and, um, and Garrett here, because of resistant wild oats, they're really going to have to you know, hand rogue in the future because there really is no other option out there. They're not going to grow continuous wheat year after year after year, and if they do, the chances are going to get in problems later on down the line. And again, if on your farms, I suppose, the uh, resistant weeds only come in very small little bits, only small bite little packages one or two or three or, or 10, or maybe a very small little patch of weeds. And if you hand rogue them at the very start, that's it, you're, you're kind of done with them. You don't have to chase them around for the next 25 years. You just get rid of them then. Um, so I suppose the other things are that come, come true from a number of different farmers, including Michael Grace talks about um, uh, grass margins have worked extremely well. There's a bit of a compliance scenario now, putting them around a lot of our hedges, uh, or a lot of our, our, our waterways, but they can work really well where, where, where growers have applied, maybe, maybe uh, unwisely maybe applied glyphosate right up into the hedges and now there's no grass with no weeds at all in there, um, it helps repopulate those, those areas. Grass weeds might only be a really good option for maybe three or four or five years, let the, 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 the hedge repopulate and till them back out again and you're kind of back to square one again and, and, and or it's back to a good position again. Um, the use of rotational ploughing has proved to be really, really useful as Owen was telling us earlier on. The use of pre-emerge herbicides really needs to be embraced, I suppose, on all farms where we can. Pretty tricky in a year like this year, but we've got to roll with the punches. But over-reliance on post-emerge herbicides, the likes of Pacifica and uh, Broadway Star in the spring, is going to lead to serious problems on most farms. Um, it's going to lead to resistance very quickly, uh, not only just in grass weeds, but also in broadleaf broad weeds as well. Um, <clears throat> And I suppose maybe one of the final ones is in terms of non-inversion or direct drill systems. Um, I suppose that the number of farmers, including one we've worked with, it's not just about maybe just doing nothing at all. There needs to be a degree of flexibility there in, in terms of um, maybe cultivating the soil where it's needed at times to be able to allow either a spring crop to go in or to, to, to help in some of the, um, the weeds that are there in front, in front. But I suppose primarily, and we, we've heard Sarah saying it earlier, um, you do need a very competitive crop in all circumstances to make sure that it competes really, really well with the weeds that you have there. So, just in terms of the, um, the case studies that we have here, of which I hope everybody's got, got a package of stuff there. It's taken a long time to get this together, and fair use to the farmers for working with us to get there. But it's taken us a long time. To, so each of the farms that's there, and we, we haven't heard from everybody today, but they're all in there. Uh, each one of those case studies is supported by a video for Bar Owens. We've only seen segments of the other four videos, and we'll have the rest of the videos up there for the farmers telling their story about how they controlled weeds, and to a degree, and again, I, I think this is massively, uh, massive credit to all the farmers, talking about some of the, um, the areas where it didn't go so well, and weeds ended up building up, um, such as... Um, uh, such as Michael Gray's talking about the double winter barley, it didn't go so well and he needed to revert back to reduce those sterile bromes down again. So it's great that they actually did that. And um, so we, we track through the year, um, all of those are up there on, and are going to be up on, on our website and on, on the, um, uh, up on the uh, YouTube uh, channel that we have there as well. The scorecards that we have um, there, one is said, uh, there's, one, there's one for wild oats and there is one for sterile brome. 
You'll notice there isn't one for ryegrass, there isn't one for blackgrass, and there isn't one for canary grass. And why is that? Well, what we, what we are very, I said, we're really clear about, certainly in our own minds at the minute, where we are as a country, um, that essentially for these weeds, first for, for wild oats and for um, sterile brome, farmer action can actually work reasonably well. And for, for the most part, around the countryside everywhere. All of the other weeds aren't. Blackgrass isn't in every farm. Canary grass isn't in every farm. Italian ryegrass isn't in every farm. Therefore, we're not suggesting that there's a whole heap of cultural control methods that can, be, that can or should be put in place on farms. What we're really saying very clearly, very strongly, zero tolerance policy is what should be practiced. You shouldn't entertain, I can live with it. Because as Bill says, you can't live with it. It's just not possible. Don't try and live with it. Just to get it out of your system, put it back into grass. That's what we're clearly saying for, for those three weeds. The other weeds here that we're, that we're going to have, and arguably you could say the resistant wild oats is one that's very hard to live with. Um, but there are, but there is a, I suppose, a mechanism in here whereby um, one person's, and this is what we found, one person's idea of uh, not so many weeds is another person's horror story. So we have, I suppose, a bit of a, you've seen all the squares we had on the, on the maps from the various different farmers. We were counting one to 10. We would try to make it a little bit simpler, count from one to five. Figure out from your own farm, what do you have? Do you have a one, do you have a five? Uh, rank that then in terms of the practice that you have in terms of cu cultural control on those various different weeds. What do you have? Put, put a number to it. Uh, and then figure out how you're gonna change it, put a number to that and see if you can improve your number. That's essentially what we're trying to do. Um, so I think there's a really good tool there to try and help farmers along the line with that. Um, but it's important that you go through that process to try and figure out where you are on that scale and how you might improve that whole scenario in it. In terms of the resources that we have, uh, all of this information is going to be up on, uh, up on our Chagas website, uh, which is www.chagas.ie, and it's a bit convoluted to get the grass weeds, but if you go into chagas.ie and just search ECT project, either from Google or within the site, you're going to get to all this information that we have. We have a huge compendium of, of information there. We've a number of webinars before. This webinar will be on it, all the videos, the 10 videos from the farmers, the case studies, the, all the bits and pieces that all be there. For those of you um, who are Chagas clients or agronomists here as well, we also have the Chagas Crop Report, which is an app that you can get on your phone. We'll have all this information readily accept accessible in that, so when you're out in the field and you want to get a bit of information quickly across the farmers, you'll have that right at your fingertips. So, look, that, that's all going to be there and all readily available for everybody. I think it's worth saying that there is a legacy to this, uh, this, this ECT programme, and I'm rightly proud of, of what we've achieved in terms of the... Um, uh, in terms of all the, the working with the farmers and everything that, that, that they've given us. But I think one of the major things is when we started this, um, grass weeds were very much a taboo, a taboo subject. I don't think it is so much anymore. The whole thing about black grass being something that you hide in the bushel in the corner, I think that's, uh, people are being a little bit more honest out there at the moment and, they're being a, and should be more honest, should be throwing up their hands and saying, I have a problem and I need help to try and sort out this problem on how we can actually, how I actually work through it, both with, within the farmers and the industry itself. I think a big thing was, John Spink mentioned earlier that um, we hadn't had a weed program for 15 years, it's actually closer to 20 years in Chagas, so we were doing nothing on it whatsoever. And um, by, by getting this, pro, get this, this project up and running, we elevated that to, to, to an extent within Chagas and that they were happy to fund a, a long-term full-time researcher in this area, which is extremely important for the industry because of all the issues that we've heard about today. So Vijay is obviously the man who's doing that, hugely capable scientist. He's banging out papers like you wouldn't believe, doing absolutely phenomenal work, a really hard worker, but he's building a team more so around him. Um, Charlotte's down the back, um, and there's, there's, a, there's another postdoc starting, and there's another, other pro, other. Uh, research um, uh, programs uh, in, uh, coming up uh, after that. So we should have a really good bank of information coming over the years from this particular program. Well, one of them is, is, is Evolve, which is ongoing at the moment. And within that, and it, it also give us, gives us capacity within the country to test uh, gra not just grass weeds, but broadleaf weeds as well, of which Vijay is doing some work on that as well. Um, you can correct me, Vijay, if I get any of these, if I miss any. Uh, we have um, speedwells, uh, marigolds, chickweeds, 
uh, spe uh, poppies, uh, willow herb, you're doing a bit of work on that. So you're taking out some of the big, bigger weeds out there that are problematic out there, doing some testing on them, kind of seeing where they're at. That wouldn't have been possible at all if VG wasn't around. And I'm, I'm, I'm rightly proud that, that, that ECT has, has spurned that in terms of a, of a good legacy for, for the whole thing. Um, which is the resistant testing. So look, I'm going to kind of finish up there. Um, I'd encourage you to bring home the material um, from, from here, uh, because if you don't bring it home, I'll have to bring it all back home to my office. So I'd love if you brought stuff yourselves and brought it home, because I don't have to do it. Um, so please do that if you can. I'll come to Adam in a second. I'm just going to thank everybody again, because I think it's really well worth thanking, certainly the project staff that were involved in it. Uh, obviously, VJ, we've David is here today. Jimmy Staples is here today. Was in it for a while. John Mann was at it for a while as well. My own colleagues in the Tilly Specialist, both Shea and and Karen Dermot Forrestal was a huge help along the way, and Susanna as well. In terms of the focus farmers, I can't say enough great things about these guys. Um, we need people, the same as any, any other project, and we're going to come up with more projects hopefully in the future. We'll need farmers to put up their hands to say, we'll help out here. They've been terrific. Uh, they've worked with us all the way throughout. They've been brilliant in terms of their. Um, their willingness to change, willingness to do different things, to try different things, I, I think they've been brilliant. And, it's, and their own tillage advisors working with them. And we had an operational group in the background. Base Ireland were, were, were a part of this because you know, they're very interested certainly in the, in the no-tills and uh, no-till system and, 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 and everything I suppose non-plough based. We had a Clayton discussion group, uh, which is a kind of a farmer-led discussion group there. ISTA being, being the seed. Uh, umbrella Group, um, um, and Bayer and Cortiva as well, who also added to the project. So we had a lot of people uh, involved in this project, and a huge thanks to everybody who are actually doing it. So with that, I'm, Adam, you have a question, if you have a, a microphone there, Kieran. Well, I'm going to do, well, this is to say thank you very much to you and your team. You put a lot of work into this. Um, when you saw on screen the, the, the sort of the checking with the grid with every field for weeds, that was students out on their hands and knees checking in awful weather conditions. Like people did work very hard on this. Um, so thank you to all of your team. Uh, it's very kind of Sarah to come over. Black Ross is a massive problem in the UK. It is not resolved. It takes a huge amount of chemical and cost. If we can avoid getting into this country, it's really, really important. The other last thing to say is to quote Michael with his beginning, where he said, this is about money in your pocket at the end of the day. Um, for Halloween, I just got my first tranche of single farm payment, or CAP or BIS. I was cut by 40%. So as tillage farmers, is anyone really looking after us? We need Chagask and the department to actually help to keep us in business. We're in a cost of living crisis. We have world market prices. We're dealing with first world costs. Uh, to have a kick in the teeth in one of our worst years possible, uh, if anyone from the department is here, I would like them to take that message home. But not to take away from you, but thank you very much, Michael. So, uh, thanks for that, uh, and, and look, I, I do appreciate there's a, there is a, um, you know, there's a huge, it's been a really tough year for, for, for farmers, and, and uh, uh, lesser support coming, which we kind of knew was coming down, down our direction, isn't helping for sure, and, and your, point is, your point is certainly well made. Um, so look, that's it, thank you very much, you as the audience, uh, for coming. We still have a workshop shop down in the back of the room, we have lots of live samples down there, if you want to do a little bit of... Um, checking with, with, with John and VJ and some of the other people to kind of really kind of get your eye into what these, some of these things actually look, some of these uh, weeds actually look like. And as a final word, I really would ask you, make sure you fill out that. There's a box at the back of the room, uh, bring them and stick them into it. Um, or if you don't get a chance to do it, uh, you can do it online by doing the QR code later on. So thanks very much and safe home, everybody. <laughs>